I was looking for him for almost two hours, the last two hours. I was really stressed, but he was here, quietly in this room. Um, give him a very warm applause because this is a master filmmaker, Nicolas Geierhalter. So, this is, I think this is typical for you, just being there, sitting, observing observing me getting like crazy. I thought you know <laughs> that I was there. Yes, they should have told me. Well, Mr. Geierhalt, it's such an honor to have you here with us tonight. And I, I'm a big fan of yours, but I think also in this, in this room, there are many of your fans. It's a long night, but people are still sitting here because they want to see and hear you. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here. And thank you for this film. Um, we all know you from uh, well-received documentaries such as Homo Sapiens, Our Daily Bread, but you made many, many more, also with your production uh, company with other uh, film directors. Um, how is ITVA Film Festival for you so far? To be honest, we just arrived, so... <laughs> Today? Yes. Really? Yeah. You arrived from Austria or did, did you come from no, another Austria. film? Austria. Austria. Oh, Austria. And how many times have you been to this festival? I was wondering, but... Yeah. Quite a lot of times. Because you were a master uh, once, two years ago, you giving master classes yeah. and teaching and yeah. yeah things yes. happen. I mean, yeah. <laughs> things happen, especially around you. Uh, we're going to have a slightly short uh, uh, session because it's a long night and we already have a lot to process with this beautiful film, but also the presentation before the film. You saw it from Mario Lang. Yeah, what, did, did, yeah. what did you think about it? Yeah, I was curious and I liked it. You liked it, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's a bit ironic that we have limited time because you as a filmmaker, you are known to take time to observe, not to intervene, uh, to make things happen without judging. Um, and sometimes when we watch your films, when I watch your films, I have the feeling I'm, I'm in a moment, I'm in a situation real time. And um, can you tell us something about the cho choices you make and um, why this form uh, works so well for you as a director? Huh. You know, I mean, I, I like to observe. And I think that um, there's a lot of power in, 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 the, in, the, in the duration of time sometimes. I mean, the shots that I'm usually doing, they are kind of composed shots. They're like a stage, a stage where reality happens. And then I just let it go. It's enough. It's already enough. For me, yes. Yes, the situation as it is. Yeah, and then usually the rhythm, I mean, the rhythm of the, of the scenes, the length of the scenes, this just comes from, from shooting. Yes. So when I'm shooting a scene, it's, it's pretty clear how long it would need to be to work. But the problem is then it, during the process of copying the material and editing, all this information gets lost and then we have to find the rhythm again. But basically it is within the material. So do you see scenes when you are walking on the street, or doing your grocery shopping or no. going to the bank? No, you're no. not in this geometrical lens of yours seeing a scene of in our daily life maybe or No, just because I'm not looking for this. No. No, but I mean basically I mean finding a scene is simple, yes. especially the way I work. There's always yes. this kind of symmetry, you just put the camera in the center and that's it. Uh, I don't <laughs> think it's simple, but uh, well, you make uh, films about various uh, themes and, and topics. How did you come to make a film about workers and their uh, work on and inside our earth? Yeah, because, um, I mean, I think it is many films. Of course, this is a film kind of criticizing human and mankind in general. And I was just curious because there was this uh, statistics that they Humans, they move much more surface material than nature does. But, um, yeah, and I... So this is interesting for you, and then you start thinking... And then, I, yeah, and then we started to think, okay, where, where does it happen? Why does it happen? And how does it look like? And to be honest, I have to say, I mean, this happens... The majority of the, of the movement of the soil happens on a much smaller scale. It's like the small construction sites. It's like everybody in the garden traveling around. Like Mario Lang. But still, I was looking for the locations that, um, that are also interesting to see and that show a lot of dimension. And, um, but on the other hand, um, I really want to say it is not the worker's fault. It's not the fault of the machine operators. They just do what, what they are told to do because um, the way that our society works 
demands this kind of materials, demands this kind of space, demands all this um, to happen what we see. So, Did your relationship with our earth or your little garden or your big, the wood behind your house, I have no idea how you live, but does the relationship, uh, is it still the same or has it changed um, after making this film and uh, this, uh, this research? No. Because, um, I mean, when you're doing a research and when you're starting a project, you kind of know what to expect. And, and especially with, with this film, I'm really, you know, I was curious about the dimension. But at the same time, I sometimes mention this, and now it's, it's probably the point to mention it. I know what I'm talking about because I know how to operate this equipment. I know how to drive an excavator. So I knew how to talk to the people. And you do? Were yes. you a worker? No, I'm not, I was not a worker. We were f over several years, we were just re kind of repairing an old farm that oh, we acquired. Wow. And there was a lot That's of great. work to do. And the easiest yes. thing is just to buy this thing and do it yourself. Do you it know? Yourself. Um, and I like, I don't even say I like to, but I happen to work with heavy equipment quite a lot also in the company when we use these um, um, cherry pickers to make these shots from high, uh, that's, that's usually what I do because I have the license, I just did it when I was young. Uh, so I was never working as a worker, but I know how to operate this equipment and this was the key to talk to the, to the other operators. Because I could tell them, hey listen, you I'm a filmmaker, language. but don't be afraid, I know what yeah. you are doing and I've, I feel I'm doing my job, you're doing your job and um, this, this was kind of, a, for me it's very important to have a conversation on the eye level and this was kind of yeah. the opening yeah. of the conversations and, and yes, I mean I like our environment but I also know how it feels if you um, change like the surface of the soil without the use of any force because you have two joysticks and you have to use them very gently and still it's an Im immense impact. Immense impact, yes. And the first time you do it, you think like, wow, you're not supposed to do it. And after a week, you're just used to it and you know it's just, it becomes normal, like so many things become normal. Like killing maybe. Yeah. In it's the end, that's how war works. Yes. It becomes <laughs> yeah. normal. Yeah. Yes. yes. I've never experienced this, but I can imagine how it works. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the human nature. Yeah, it's beautifully put. It's not beautiful, but it's beautifully put. Um, um, but you, you say um, it's not the, the fault of the workers. Of course not. But I, when I watch your films, and maybe people in the audience as well, I have the idea or the feeling you want to observe, but not to judge. Do you want us to just watch and think about things, not to judge too easily? Um, but do you have an opinion when, of you, course, are, of course. when you are and filming? I, I think I do judge in some way, but I do it between the lines. That's what we try when we're editing the material. Well, that, there, there is some kind of opinion or message or point of view that, that can be read between the lines. But um, I'm not um, pronouncing it very loud, because I would think this would be boring in the end, you know? But uh, if everything works well, the audience and me will be of one opinion, but the audience might think that it was their own idea to get there. So it's... It's, it's like kind of, poetry. You, it's you, a bit like poetry. It's not and too it's also easy. A, yes, and it, it's also a bit like influencing the audience, but in a way that, I mean, like offering. I would say we offer a kind of way that this film could be read, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like this. And How did you come to this style? Uh, how did you, because you didn't go to film school, you were <laughs> rejected three times, and, so, and yet you are a very big filmmaker. You are very uh, well-known internationally. You're not the only international, re uh, um, well, um, big filmmaker internationally who didn't go to film school. But um, do you need film school? Is it inside of you already? Or did you find this style? Um, well, to be honest, I mean, when I was rejected from the film school for the third time, I was really pissed. And I think I started making documentaries because I was stubborn and I wanted to show them that I can still do it. Yes. And for many, many years I missed film school in the sense that I was also operating the camera myself and that was a time when we were still shooting on film material and I never learned that. I learned it all by myself. And um, this was possible but this, was a, um, this wasn't too easy. Other than that, I mean, I, when I was not at film school, I still knew many people there and and later, um, they told me that I could be happy that I wasn't there because probably the teachers wouldn't allow me to do the films in the way that I do because they are against any rules. Like, so they would break your style. Well, this, they would this break it, but style. it's not. It's not. 
in some way, this is not professional, you know. But mm, well. it's it's a style. But Do we need film schools? Of if we, we see of this without film school, it's inside. It was uh, inside of you, in Nicolas, your own style. It's very. Um, uh, it's your own particular uh, view and style and way of filmmaking. So maybe it's a good thing for you that you didn't go to film school at the end. For me, maybe yes, in the end, but not for everybody and yeah. for, for not for the majority of people, I would say. But don't we get all the same filmmakers with same styles? When we all go to the same film school? Yeah, but you can try a lot. Yeah. You can try you out can a, lot a lot of things, you know, yes. and, and you get to know people, teams. Yes. How did you get your team? Because you have a very big team you work with. You have your own production yeah, company with many directors. How did that come? How did you form that? I mean, when I was doing my first film, all of us were non-professionals. We were just friends. Oh. And even today, I mean, when I'm working, I prefer to work with people... It's not so much about profession, you just have to get along in some way. And um, it's, I mean, you have a lot of people in the credits, but this is also because we're just shooting episode by episode, and then we start editing, and then two or three months later we shoot the next episode, and then there is just people are not available, you work with other ones. Um, I've been working with a lot of people whom I don't know too well, just because you need somebody, you know? But basically, they usually come from film school. So they teach you. Um, my last question, I have many more questions, but I want to give you the opportunity to talk to Mr. Gerhalter. Um, um, what would you, what would you, when, when there is a, a little Nicholas and he's rejected to film school and he really wants to go, what would you say to him? What would you like to learn him in this uh, current time of filmmaking. There are many, many people who want to make films. There are many filmmakers already. Uh, how do you really um, uh, form your own particular style to become, um, well, an author, not a <laughs> just filmmaker? You know, that's the key issue. Yes. And that's, I mean, I'm teaching sometimes at film schools. Yes. I don't hate them. <laughs> and. Um, the problem that I really have is telling the students, listen, I mean, I did it my way, yes. and I can explain how I do it and why I do it like this. I can't teach you anything else because I don't know how to do it differently, but I cannot recommend you to do what I do because there is such a limited space for films like this. This is the art house documentaries and the market can maybe bear like a dozen of them per year and not more. And it's still hard to live with this, you know? So I simply can't tell the pupils how to get into the business because I don't know about the business. Because you only know your situation and And your I can't style. recommend to do this really hardcore art house documentaries because the market is getting more and more thin and thin, yes, you know? Yes, Narr more that's, narrow. that's the truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, wow, a lot to talk about. But there are questions in the room. I come to you and uh, I'll give you the microphone. Hello, I really liked the documentary, thank you for that. But I wanted to ask, how did you make the high altitude uh, frames? By drones. drone or? Drone, drone, yes. Drones? Yes. Okay. That's also interesting because people are working more and more with drones now. What, what do you think about that? Drones, you see every film, every yeah, romantic <laughs> comedy, you see drone shots. Everywhere, drone shots. Yeah, and you know, I think like 50 years from now, you can tell this film was shot in 19 and, uh, 2015. Or it's just modern. And it's fancy, and for some films it works well and it looks cool. But that's why I, for example, decided to use the drones only for the steady shots. I don't want to fly. With one exception, in uh, the, last, the last shot in Hungary, where we were following this truck through the mud, that was also a drone shot, but it's, it could have been a steady cam or yes, something. Yes. But basically, I, I mean, even if the, in the films that I did before, I very often used um, the shots from the high altitude, and we used these big cherry pickers and all this heavy machinery to get there. And compared to this, it's, it's kind of uh, very simple to work with a drone. And it's easy and it's fast and drones. it's cheap. Yes. I am happy, yes, but um, you have to know what to do with yes. it. How to use it. Yes. 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 Are there questions for Nicolas? Yes. 
How did you manage to film the explosions from close by? And, and was any equipment damaged when you yes. were doing that? I mean, these explosions, of course, we did not shoot with the big camera. We uh, always had three action cams beside each other, and we were hoping that one would survive. More questions? Do you have a question? You look like you have. Yes, you look like you have a question. You're thinking about things. Yes, you do. Um, when planning the documentary, did you, when planning the documentary, uh, did you also think about uh, go filming uh, the, hi the hierarchy, like on top of the workers, or, or you just like wanted to focus on the workers uh, from the beginning? Yeah, and, I was. And if if so, did you get like did you get any veto into not going here, not going there, while doing this work with uh, with multinationals? Okay, for the first. I was very sure I just wanted to shoot the workers and not the bosses. And I didn't want to have any official opinions of the companies or... Mm, I just wanted to stay with the people who really do the job. And I mean, with all those companies, or all those locations that are in the film, except the last one in Canada where we did not get any filming permissions. So those locations, they were easy to access because we had the good luck that the owners or the press people or whoever was responsible for those locations, they really understood what I was doing and they trusted us. Otherwise, we couldn't have worked. But during the phase of the research, I think like 99% of, of our requests, they were just denied. Or not even denied, the companies just didn't answer or they just delayed the answer and said, okay, we need to ask this person, we need to ask this person, and it, this goes on for half a year and a year, and in the end, it just doesn't happen and you can't even tell that they didn't allow us to shoot. You know, they, they just, they just, yeah, it's, it's just, but anyway, so what I wanted to say, it's, it's, it was very hard to find locations and companies and, and, and responsible people who really let us in because with, especially with mining, there is so much money involved and there are so many shareholders and then, you know, they all afraid of a bad image and they want to control. They want to control all the imagery, and, and they can't control it anyway, because on YouTube you find all this kind of movies shot with a mobile phone from the workers themselves, and since they cannot control this, they try to control the official media, and this usually leads to denial. And, but then sometimes you happen to run into people who say, okay, you did these kind of films before, we saw that you are kind of fair, we believe you, and then it just happens. I mean, this was... The, the case in Spain, this was the case in, in Carrara, this was the case in, in Hungary, where we were shooting it with, the, with the coal mine. We tried so many coal mines before in Germany, in, in Czech Republic, many locations, they all denied. And then in Hungary, they were just, in some way, they were naive and they were nice. And they said, yes, come, why not? And then we had the good luck that in Hungary they had this, this um, five million year old trees. We didn't know this before. So in the end, all the other denials, they they led to a better result in the end. But it was really, uh, research for this film took years and years and still while we were shooting, we were still researching and trying to get the final locations. But that's, that's I think, most of the time to get to the, the case with your films because you're always working in a sort, sort of uh, bureaucracy kind of environment where you have to get permission for this or get inside of that factory or at that border or that's something you you uh, always uh, do in your films so it must be yes and i have to admit that i'm not doing this myself i'm very happy that other people for doing all do this kind of research and, and job because i wouldn't be good in it and i wouldn't have the also the um, stamina to yes 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 and i wouldn't have the patience yes. once i'm on a location i know what i'm doing but but you getting to there is, is a totally different job yeah. Oh, you have a good team. Um, are there other questions? Yes. Hi, I was wondering, oh, sorry. I was wondering um, why you filmed uh, the people you did an interview with, so the workers, in a that certain way, so you really let them uh, watch into the camera, so I was really curious about your intentions behind that, and also why you put the black screen uh, in between uh, different parts of the interview. Yeah, I mean, 
that's the way I'm shooting interviews all my life, basically. Um, I like protagonists to really stare into the eyes of the audience. And to achieve that, they have to stare into the lens. Or basically, a little bit lower than the lens, actually. So, um, I, when I'm shooting these interviews, I'm, I'm hiding behind the camera, and, and underneath the camera, there is a little spot, a kind of a hole in the tripod underneath, under the plate where the camera is fixed, so that's where our eyes meet. And then in the, in the, in the cinema, you really have, because, because the heads, they're usually above the center line, so they are looking down at you. I just like that, because it's, again, for me, uh, this is a kind of a stage, and that's also what I tell the people. It's, I'm framing, I'm framing a stage for you, and you are the actor, and you're basically playing yourself, but of course we are filming you. It's not like we are not there. It's a conference between you and me and the camera in between, and, and, and of course, like, many people will, will see you, and you're talking to many people. I want, I want the protagonists to be aware of the situation. We are not trying to hide the camera. And um, I've, I have the feeling it's just very strong, and also it's like a portrait photography. When you're doing a portrait, people look into the lens, and, and that's a side effect of it. You can really have a look at the people for minutes while they are talking, and, but not only at the people. You can have a look at, at all, the, all the surroundings, at all the environment. That's also because 99% of these films are usually shot with a wide-angle lens, because I want to create a shot where, where the people are really set within the environment. Sometimes I ask them, where would you like to be portrayed? Sometimes these are the better locations, sometimes I choose them, but at, at least I want, I want something to go on in the background. So you can choose, either you watch the people or you watch the background, but there is something. And about the black frames, um, I still don't, don't know any better solution. Because what is usually done, like cutting away or putting some picture in between, it's just boring, you know? It just takes the concentration and it's... I wanted dialogue to flow in a way, you know? I mean, the only thing that changed since... I mean, this is, I think, my 13th film, and, and even with my first film, we started with these black frames. I think in the beginning, it was really one full second. Then at some point, it, it, it went to 18 frames. I think now this, we ended up with 16 frames. So this is my kind of uh, reaction to the faster times we're living in, that the blacks are a little bit... <laughs> but basically, I've, that's just the way I like it. Um, are there more? Yes. That's the last question, and then I'm going to ask you a little closing question. Uh, very nice film. Um, are there activists posing against these um, destro destroyment of the earth? Are there activists against this destroyment of the earth? This problem, yeah. I guess. I guess. I mean, especially with, um, I mean, Coal mining has a lot of criticism, and what is going on in Canada with this um, oil, oil fields, I mean, that's really... The fracking. Is, yeah, I, actually, what you see is not fracking, it's, 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 it's a tar sands, oh. but there is a lot of criticism. And in the end, what this film is used for, yeah. I cannot tell. It is there, and it's an offer, and maybe some activists use it. I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. If, is it used for activist purposes or to, to screen them? Well, we don't know. Does, does, does it matter if it's taken out of context of the Well, film the context, the context is... Another? I mean, everything can be used out of context. But if the activists use it, it's fine, I guess. But it is very, for me, it's important that if people trust me, if companies trust me, the only thing I can promise is that I produce a film in the end that is fair. Whenever things are taken out of context, even if it's the same episode, if it's without the other episodes, it could be read as being unfair. So that's it's just uh, 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 give some clips or yes, that's, yeah. that's big discussions that we usually have with our broadcasting partners who fund this project because usually they have the rights to take out any clip and use it for every, any 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 other things, you know. And then we, until now, with the commissioning editors, they understand and we flag the whole film and so we tell you cannot use any second because it would be out of context and it would break the trust that the people gave me. But I'm not sure how long this is going to work. So um, that, that is a big topic, to be honest. Quite yeah? interesting, yes. Uh, are you an activist? Not in the common sense, no. In what sense are you? 
Well, I mean, filmmaking is activism, but yes. it's more quiet. Yes. Well, we are here at the documentary festival, and um, you just arrived today. What are filmmakers or films you would like to to see during your stay here in Amsterdam? Are they any uh, films on your menu already? Or you just go with the flow? I have to be so honest. We just arrived, and they went here and didn't even have a look at the catalog. <laughs> I'll give you a catalog, Sorry. so they're great films. We have some really nice programs here as well. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas Geirhalter. Thank you. And, um, well, tomorrow we have another dog talk. And Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So be there. Thank you very much.